Hi, hi, Sharon. Hi, I actually see you on Zoom. Oh, wonderful. Everyone else can see you. All right. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. We're just gonna give it a few more minutes to let others log in. Can you see me on video? Okay. Yes. So how many people do you have now? Uh, we've got 25. How is the background here? I see more people are joining, just going to give it one more minute here. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and, and start and I assume more people uh, will join as we go along. Um, hi everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining us. We're really happy you're able to join us for this special event. Uh, my name is Natalie Farahan and it's an honor to be here with you all. Um, I hope you and your loved ones are, are staying safe and healthy and that you had a really nice Shavuot despite the very odd circumstances that we're finding ourselves in these days. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, the founding I'm one of the founding staff members of Jimena's Los Angeles chapter, and I help build out the organization in LA. I currently work for Birthright Israel Excel as the Associate Director of Community Engagement. I continue to be involved in Jimena as a volunteer and young adult leader. Um, Jimena is a Jewish nonprofit organization based in San Francisco, whose mission is to achieve universal, universal recognition for the heritage and history of the 1 million Jewish refugees from the Middle East and North Africa and their descendants. Jemena programs aim to ensure that the accurate history of Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews is incorporated into mainstream Jewish and Middle Eastern narratives in order to create balance in attitudes, narratives, and discourse about Middle East refugees in the modern Jewish experience. Jemena operates through an education and engagement initiative and an advocacy program. Through this period of quarantine, Jemena is leading a lot of different uh, web-based programs, and I encourage you all to visit our website, www.jemena.org, to learn more about the various programs we're offering. As a Mizrahi woman of Iraqi Jewish descent, moderating a Farhud commemoration is very personal to me. 
My family survived the, the Farhud in Baghdad. Their Muslim neighbors hid them in their home. My grandmother was not yet born, um, but her parents and her siblings um, were able to survive. Thank you. Thanks to the, their kind neighbors. Um, while there are riots happening literally today in most of the cities across the United States, I think it's most important than ever to share the stories of riots that happened 79 years ago in Baghdad. And while we're all, we are all witnesses to history repeating itself in various forms, so I think it's really important that we all tell our stories. Um, we're lucky to be joined today by Lily Shore. She is Director of External Relations from the Babylonian Jewish Heritage Center in Or Yehuda, Israel. Iraqi Jews are very lucky to have a beautiful and often time overlooked museum dedicated to their heritage and history in the heart of Israel. The Babylonian Heritage Center operates a research center, publishing house, library, and archives, and I encourage you all to visit during your next trip to Israel. We're also very honored and lucky to have with us today, Joe Samuels. Joe and I met seven years ago when I first got involved with Jemena, fresh out of graduate school. Since then, Joe has become a friend, a mentor, and most importantly, he's like family. About a month ago, I reached out to Joe to check in with him during quarantine. Um, I sent him a text and I, I told him to stay safe. And he replied with, uh, live dangerously, but stay safe. And nothing encapsulates Joe's life story and demeanor more than that phrase. I won't have to explain much more. You'll hear it shine through in his story as we go along today. Joseph Yusef Samuels was born in Taft el Takia, the Jewish quarter of the old city of Baghdad in 1930. And he was 10 years old when the Farhud took place. Joseph was one of eight children and he graduated from the Al Adidia High School. In 1949, Joseph traveled from Baghdad to Basra by train and was smuggled out to Iran and then to Israel. A homeless, penniless refugee, he arrived in Israel in 1950. Joseph spent some time on a kibbutz. He took different jobs and finally joined the Israeli Navy. He finished his service in 1953. With his dream for higher education, he left for Montreal, Canada in 1956. In 1959, he married Rebecca and had three children, Sharon, Lisa, and Jeffrey. Joe and his family moved to Santa Monica, California in 1978, where they remain. Another really exciting fact is that Joe released a book about his life this past April titled Beyond the Rivers of Babylon, and I encourage you all to pick up a copy. We'll touch upon parts of his book throughout this conversation. Um, Joe, uh, we'll begin your presentation with, uh, with a few pictures and then we'll carry on with our, with our fireside chat. So I'm going to share my screen here. Joe, go ahead. One moment, I want to get to my, uh, where is my uh, at my age I try technology but I still uh, can you uh, uh, Natalie can you take that picture because I want to 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 see my sure. Uh, Put down that. Do you want me? Yes, and I'll tell you when to put that. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, one of the guidelines that I follow that made my journey through life exciting, meaningful, and happy is to live up to what I call the attitude of gratitude. I start my day, my morning, with saying "Modeani," and. I continue to find something to be thankful for. I attempt to at least twice a day to say thank you to my wife. And when my children or grandchildren call me, I never miss to say thank you. So for my first thank is to Jimena, uh, to the founder, Gina Waldman. Uh, she herself is a refugee from Libya, to the director, Sarah Levin, and the two organizers of this web webinar, Natalie and Sapir. I want to welcome and thanks everybody for joining here. I hope that by sharing my 
experience, sharing my experience with you will stimulate your mind and perhaps to appreciate a little more about life. I want to say thank you in Hebrew and in Arabic. Bruchim abayim ele shidovre ivrit ba'aretz berchavei olam. Ani sameyah shiatem ba'im lekan toda raba. Marhaba bikum ele jalia al-Iraqiya wa kulli al-ladini yatakallamu al-lugha al-Arabiya. Alfi marhaba. Last Friday, I spoke three days ago, I spoke with a journalist from Dubai and he had a vast knowledge about the Jewish Arab issue. We had a lengthy and very respectful conversation and I invited him to join us today at the webinar. He replied, inshallah, God be willing. I hope he is with us. But he asked me a question while entering the conversation. What is the secret or the, the, for the success and prosperous of the Jews? The answer is this very, what we are doing today is, is part of the answer. But the real answer, how we survive the difficulties and the unpredictable events is we remember the past and remember not to live in the past. For living in the past is a voluntarily enslavement of the present that darken the hope of the future. Today's topic is very serious and perhaps somber, talking about a sad event. I would like to start it with a, a short humor. This is a story, a true story of mine. When I was young, I was a little shy. So someone suggested taking a public speaking course. At the end of the course, the instructor said, whenever you are invited to speak, remember that a good speech is like a bikini short enough to be interesting and long enough to, be, to cover the subject. So with that, I have prepared the PowerPoint slides that will tell the history of the Jews, in a, excuse me, that will tell the story of the, of the Jews from Arab, in Arab land from the beginning and that will bring us to today. I, I will, uh, to follow the bikini model, I'll be very short and will probably will miss many details. Natalie, would you be kind enough now to put the, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint? Of course. This slide tells us the first recorded history that how the Jews, how the, in the year 586 BC, when the King Nebuchadnezzar conquered the land of Israel and, uh, and exiled the Jews to Babylonia. He brought all the young, the energetic, the people with, uh, with, that he thought will be wise, that will try to build his country. Uh, and we can see that the story is in Psalm number 137, which says, on the rivers of Babylon, where we sat and cried. With them, with this exile, many prophets came with them. Next, Natalie, please. This is the tomb of Ezekiel. There are at least four prophets uh, that are buried in Iraq. This is the tomb of prophet Ezekiel. Uh, also the prophet Ezra and Jonah in the north and, and Nahum, Nehemiah. Uh, this past Shavuot, in Baghdad, we didn't call it Shavuot. We called it Eid Ziyara, 
the, the festival of the pilgrimage. And we used to go to visit the tomb of Ezekiel, which is about 60 miles uh, away uh, uh, far from Baghdad. Next, please. 70 years later, after Nebuchadnezzar brought the Jews as uh, to Babylonia, the uh, Persian emperor, King Cyrus the Great, conquered Babylonia and he allowed the Jews to go back to build the second temple. Uh, this stone here to the right, it's, uh, it's a decree that shows that the Jews were allowed to go back. In fact, I saw it personally when they brought it to the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. I can't read the writing, but I was told that what, it, what, what is in it. Next. Then it, the second destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem, 70 uh, CE. Uh, the Roman uh, conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. This is just a painting uh, showing the destruction. Next. Uh, after destruction of the temple, this is a map that shows the disbursement, the Jewish disbursement in the diaspora. We can see that they were in Persia, Iraq, the what we call today Saudi Arabia, Yemen, all the way from North Africa, and they went all the way to Spain. Next. The biggest event that happened, the Jews lived under different rulers, the Mongols, the Greeks, the Assyrians, but the biggest event happened in the seventh century. After the death of the prophet Muhammad, few thousand zealous Muslims went out to, to uh, spread Islam. They went on horses, camels, by foot, and they went out at the Saudi Arabia from the, the desert. And within one century, they occupied all of North Africa. They went to Spain. They occupied the Middle East, uh, uh, Iran, all the way to Afghanistan and India and all the way to China. Many, many ask, how could they do these few thousand people? How could they do it? And that is a, a long topic that we, it is not for, for us to discuss today. But then the Islam came in and conquered Babylonia. The Jews in, a, in two centuries, they were Arabatized. They used to speak Ar Aramean, uh, uh, Aramaic. Now they learned to speak Arabic and they became part of the culture. They had a special, uh, they lived under special, what they call the Omar decree. They were used, they lived as a dhimmis, protected, they pay higher taxes. They were not allowed to ride a horse in the city or to build the house higher than the Muslim. But the Muslim allowed them to continue to practice Judaism. Next. This is a map of the Ottoman Empire, the, uh, the areas that occupied by the, the Turks, the Ottoman Empire from 1453 for 350 years. You could see how they expanded all the way to North Africa and they were the Eastern Europe, all the Greece and all the way to the gates of Vienna in Austria. And of course, they occupied the, this part of Iraq. And uh, that's where uh, my ancestors who stayed in Iraq lived. Next. The, the Arabs helped the allies to defeat Turkey. And uh, this is a map after World War I, how the British and the French created these line and countries. And the French controlled Syria and Lebanon, and the British controlled Iraq, 
and they what they created, what they call it, Transjordan or Palestine right here. Next, please. When uh, the Iraq, when the British allowed Iraq to self-rule, they, they elect, they brought in a member of the Hashemite family, King Faisal the uh, first. His cousin Abdullah, uh, they, as a reward to the, to the help that they, the the Arab, to the to the Allies, they rewarded them. The uh, and King Abdullah became the king of Transjordan, which is now called Jordan. This is a picture of King Faisal in the middle with the hat. King Faisal was a kind and a very wise person. He realized that the Jewish community in Baghdad was vital to the, uh, the construction and building of the new country, Iraq. This picture shows that he is with the Jewish community. And next, please. He, at that time, he appointed the first Jewish finance minister, Sasson Haskell, uh, that attributed to, found to, the, to him that it found treasury and one of the most important uh, 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 benefits to Iraq, where he linked the selling of the oil to the gold. And to the extreme right, we see another member of the Jewish community uh, uh, that he was member of the uh, Senate, Menachem Daniel. Next, please. We can see here a real picture of King Faisal. He believed with the, uh, the return, allowed the return with the Jews to, the, to their homeland. This is a picture with Dr. Chaim Weizmann the first president of the United States. Uh, next. And his death, 1933, his son, King Ghazi, took over. King Ghazi, uh, oh, I wanted to comment that the Jewish life, wherever they lived, whether in Iraq or in other countries, all dependent upon the ruler. If the ruler was kind, the ruler, then they lived and they prospered and in turn prospered the country. When the ruler were not, then the opposite happened, they suffered. So under King Ghazi, the, the, Jewish, the, the, the Jewish community life began to decline. He was flirting with Nazism and he was inf influenced by the model of Hitler. Uh, the British didn't like it. And in 1939, he died. Uh, in the paper, they said he died with a, by a car accident. But the rumor is that the British have eliminated him. Uh, next, please. Then uh, this is. Uh, it shows during his period how uh, the, they were flirting with Hitler. When he died, he, uh, his son, King Faisal II, I believe he was something like seven, eight years old, became the king. So I appointed his uncle, Abdul Ilah, as a regent to guide him till his maturity. In 1941, in April 1 of 1941, there was the coup, a coup, a pro-Nazi coup, headed by Rashid Ali al-Gailani. You can see him aided by the uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini, the, uh, uh, the uh, Mufti of, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. And here's a picture with the Mufti with Hitler. He was well known as a uh, really anti-Semite uh, in, 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 the, in the Middle East. Next. 
This is a, a, a picture of the Farhud that took place in June 1 of 1941. That actually was the first day of Shavuot. And I will translate the subtitle in Arabic. It says, a rare picture of the Farhud in Baghdad in the year 1941. The Jews are in the upstairs floor looking down and the Muslim, they carry daggers, swords and sticks are below waiting to attack. I will be detailing more about the Farhud. This is just a brief introduction and I will be discussing more about the Farhud after the, uh, the PowerPoint. Next, please. Uh, during the Farhud, this is a mass murder of the, uh, according to the official, there was 179 people, Jewish people died, but the uh, Jewish community said might be at least 600 and a few thousand injured. This is a picture where they're quickly buried in a, in a mass grave in Baghdad. Next, please. Uh, this is, I said that this is the family, our family portrait. Uh, only one brother is missing, uh, Eliyahu, uh, and he was in Jerusalem at the time at the university. And I am sitting to the far right here, and notice my father with a special head head cup head head uh, hat. This was the called the sidara, a typical respectful hat. At the in, in, in Baghdad or in Iraq. Next, please. This is in 1947 when the idea of the partition of, uh, of, of creating a Jewish state partition of Palestine. This is a demonstration uh, where it shows uh, the, in Arabic the translation down with the Palestinian. There were we were a student in high school. We had to join them for the fear of being accused that we are Zionist or we are against uh, the, uh, we are for the uh, creating of a Jewish state. So the, uh, the, uh, the idea of against pre uh, creating a Jewish state was there. It doesn't matter what size of Jewish state it is, but they were against it. No place for a Jewish state in the Palestine of the Brit by the British mandate. Next, please. In when Iraq failed in its war against eliminating Israel of May 1948, uh, they came back they, the, the Iraqi turned against the Jewish community of Baghdad, which is, was the time approximately 25% of the population. So somebody arrests, uh, a kidnapping, disappearance, and uh, of course, torture began. And here is the culminated by arresting a prominent uh, Jewish merchant Shafiq Adas, and accusing him being spy and supporting Israel. Shafiq was so prominent in Iraq that he has connection with the royalty and the government. But all that didn't help because they want to show the population that they are against anybody who is supporting Israel. So Shafiq Adas, here's a picture that he was uh, taken to be hanged. Next, please. Uh, this is a map that shows in 1948 where the Jewish population in the Arab land, uh, the, the estimated. Uh, of course, the census is not accurate, but they're estimated between 850,000 to 1 million Jews lived from Iran all the way to Morocco. You can see Morocco is 200, estimated 265,000. 
the Iraq 150. And at the bottom in the blue, you will see in 218, how many Jews left in the Arab land. And in, 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 in Iran, 8,500. 8, and Tun Tunisia, still they lived in an area called Jarba, about 1,100. Next, please. Uh, when, when I faced the problem, uh, and, and when I graduated in 1948, I was, uh, I, I wanted to, to go to America to study. I got visa and I got three accepted university, but they were refused me the uh, Khuruj, which I will talk further about it later in my, in my uh, questions and answers. This is, so I, uh, uh, I took, uh, with my brother Nuri, younger brother, three years old, younger, younger I, I, we went to Basra, and in Basra, we took this uh, river boat, uh, and we hid under, that was a, a false room, covered by hay, and by, uh, by a, a small boat that with the two smugglers here, by a row, and by punting to cross to go to smuggle to, to Iran. Next, please. From Iran, I found my way. They, uh, they, they flew us to, uh, to Israel. Uh, of course, uh, Alaska Airline was uh, noted for uh, donating the airline to help. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, there was no, uh, uh, seat, the seats were, uh, wooden benches, there was no seat belts, and of course there was no food. So we flew from Tehran, going all the way up north to Turkey, crossing the Mediterranean, uh, and then and la landing to Israel. Uh, we could, the plane could not fly over Iraq or Syria or, or Jordan. So they had to take route about five, maybe, or six hours. Uh, we had no food. But, and then we arrived to Israel, and that's where we stayed in the refugee camps here, which again, I will talk further uh, in my, in, uh, further on. Next. Uh, I joined here the Israeli Navy. Uh, and and uh, after, as, uh, after working in a kibbutz and work, I had to join the, into the Navy. My dream of going to college was also was crushed at the time, Israel did not care about the somebody who wanted to study to delay uh, the service because they needed uh, bodies, soldiers to defend themselves. The last slide, I was hesitating whether to show it to you. It's very dramatic, but it's actually part of the living in Iraq, where I used to see that on my way to school. So forgive me if it is too dramatic and some of you are too young to see. Natalie, please show the last one. Here we show that the public square and how the hanging, I saw that when I was young. When I went to school, see that people hanging in the square. And the last picture here in 1969, I will talk about it more uh, with the hanging of the Jews. I am with a fellow called Aaron Zangi, a survivor of the hanging from 1969. Thank you very much. And this is the uh, this end of this slide. Joe, thank you so much uh, for giving us the context. I know some of this uh, is difficult to share, so we're, we're really grateful to have you here with us. Um, in order to keep this an orderly conversation, we put everyone on mute. Um, we're gonna see if we have time for Q&A at the end. If you do, please write your questions in the Zoom chat box. Um, it would be great if you could type your name and location to introduce yourself. Um, all right, so Joe, uh, I want to I want to begin with uh, asking you to tell us a little bit about your childhood and what was life like as a young boy in Baghdad. Tell us a little bit about your family and your experiences. 
Thank you for asking. Uh, my childhood, to summarize it, was a happy one. Uh, my world was perhaps two to th two th three miles square. We had the baker, the butcher, the sweet maker, all walking distance. The schools, the synagogue, uh, the street in the old city of Baghdad were, uh, they call it street, but lanes were narrow, jaggered, and, uh, and, 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 and paved. To we have by the play with the kids was on the street. We used to play what is called some of you may remember. It's called torro bilbil. The a small we take a small piece of wood and put it on a hole, and with a long stick we hit it, and it goes the the person who hit it as far as he can uh, is the winner. We played marble on the streets. I never had any gifts. I didn't know about birthdays. We, I've never, I don't remember anybody celebrating birthdays. In fact, I don't know the exact day of my birth. I know I was told it was the Hanukkah of 1930. Uh, so uh, I knew it's December. The family was structured. We lived a uh, very structured family. The, uh, and we, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, just give me a minute here. One moment, forgive me. Again, the technology. Yeah, uh, I'm here. I had uh, six brothers and one sister and our home was uh, somehow religious. Uh, Shabbat was, uh, Shabbat uh, Friday night was a, a great event. Uh, we all gathered together, no matter what important things to do. Uh, my father came uh, from the synagogue wearing a white suit. And uh, after the Kiddush, we all stood up in line to, to kiss his hand. Uh, uh, it was uh, my, my parent, uh, my father, just working with my, uh, my older brother, who was 20 years older, and my father started the business of textiles. And we just beginning to improve our financial, uh, our, our financial uh, situation. Yes. Great, Joe. Um, so... So in 1941, the Farhud took place uh, and decimated the, the Jewish quarter in Baghdad, Iraq. Can you provide a little more historical insight? What was the Farhud and why did it, why did it happen? Great question. Uh, after the coup that happened in uh, uh, April 1, uh, the, it began a consistent propaganda of Nazism, blaming the Jews for everything, uh, the newspapers, uh, the radio, of course, Radio Baghdad, uh, that controlled by the Iraqi government. Uh, they were, uh, they, as they arrested some Jews for accusing them of spying. One guy was being accused because he had a flashlight uh, after the uh, the coup uh, that they, they uh, signaling to the British planes where to bomb, uh, life became intolerable, and uh, the continuous the propaganda and uh, of uh, in, 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 after they, they they took over, they uh, uh, they translated uh, Hitler's famous book uh, Mein Kampf. And they, uh, in Arabic, they created the fetua, the youth that are brought up uh, in, in the indoctrination of uh, Nazism. Uh, Rashid Ali al Gailani and his crew and his uh, government uh, that, that uh, continuously uh, try to, uh, to, to emphasize how the Jews are the. 
uh, th those people uh, that uh, that are against the government. Uh, and and then uh, at the end, and uh, toward the end of May thirty first. The British uh, army, uh, getting fresh, fresh, fresh group from uh, India and the Gorkha from uh, Nepal, uh, came arrived to the outskirts of Baghdad. Uh, once the British arrived at the outskirts of Baghdad, the leaders, the coup leaders, fled to to Iran and from there were to occupied Europe. So the, uh, the, 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 the crowd went rampant and they went to the Jewish quarters. They looted and burnt. They killed the men and women, raped women and, and killed them. Uh, they, uh, we, what, uh, what happened to us, we moved a year earlier, I think, yeah, the, yeah. Forgive me. Yes, and and uh, we moved a year earlier to an area called Babi Shargi, so our home was not hit. And uh, I showed you saw the mass. Uh, there was 179 people estimated killed, Jewish killed, and they were buried buried in the mass grave uh, in Baghdad. Uh, we were happy because it was the evening of Shavuot. So uh, when the British came in, some people came to try to meet the, the, the uh, regent. They were met by Muslim and they attacked them. They killed and they killed one of them. And uh, so this is the brief history. And I would emphasize that there are, there were some Muslim men that stood up in front of the Jewish homes to protect them. Uh, in fact, I think one of the people that joining us, his, his name is Steve Aker uh, on the webinar here, his house, uh, the landlord of his house, a Muslim, stood up and protect him. Uh, and another person that a friend of mine, that his house was totally robbed his name is Shaul Moshi, just passed away a few months ago. But I have his story in my book, both story of Steve and, and Moshi in my book. Thank you, Joe. Um, so can you just share some of your personal memories from the Farhud? Uh, what happened to you and your family? The uh, Passover fell on April 12th. Passover was a great, my favorite uh, festival. Uh, I was so happy uh, when the Passover came in, I got new clothes and I was, uh, but this time our Passover became, was gloomy. Uh, we, Eliyahu, my older brother, six years older, he was very adventurous and he took his bicycle to go to visit his friend. So on his way, he saw the blood on the street. He saw the minibuses stopped by the, uh, the crowd, the looter, the Muslims, uh, selecting the Jewish passengers, uh, robbed them and murdering them. So he came back quickly traumatized. At home, we uh, brought the big uh, heavy furniture to put it in in behind our door, just in case we will be attacked. I helped bring hot water, not hot water, buckets of water to the roof, which we were boiling in case of they come and attack us. Uh, I, I was looking from the roof and I saw one guy carrying lots of clothes and I locked eyes with him and I felt that if his, with his hand, as if he's telling me that we will back getting back to you. My brother Eliyahu electrified the fence. We had a garden 
with a stone wall and we had the chicken fence. So my brother Eliyahu uh, fence, uh, electrified that fence. So we were not, it's, thank God, they, uh, the 2nd of June, the British came in, uh, the, the army with the Iraqis and stopped the, the riots. So we were not actually uh, invaded or uh, hit by the, uh, by the writers. But my two uncles' houses, Uncle Moshi and Uncle Meir, in the old city of Baghdad, they were robbed. They were fortunate that they jumped from one house to another on the roof and they were saved. So they came to us. Uh, we had to buy them some clothes, some furniture to go back after the, the Farhut. Uh, Thank you, Joe. So, so uh, the Farhut is considered a major turning point um, in Iraqi Jewish history. What was the result of all of this and, and what happened to you and your family? How did you leave? Uh, after the Farhud, well, during the Farhud, we couldn't have any place where to go, where to hide. There was no country to take us. So that the situation we faced. The leaders thought maybe this would be a blip. Uh, we have to look to the future and we have to, you know, to stay and to live to do our best. By the way, no one of the writers were arrested. No one was uh, uh, found guilty or, or, being, uh, or sent to jail. So life went on. I, what I believed when I, was, when, I, when I grew up, that Baghdad was my home and Iraq was my country, that totally shattered after the Farhud. I wanted to get out. I wanted to study and to leave. So I, I studied and I got graduated uh, in, in 1948, and I wanted to leave uh, to, to leave Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, the uh, the Jewish community, uh, most uh, there are very few could afford, and some people left. But uh, the most of us stayed in, in in Baghdad till what happened in 1948. In 1948, when Iraq failed in its war, they turned against the Jewish community and anti-Semitism was in the open, arrest, similar arrest, a summary arrest and, uh, uh, and imprisonment and torture. Uh, I got accepted in three universities and I got a visa and a passport, my brother uh, gave enough bribe. By the way, bribe was our way of living. In order to survive, we were, uh, we always had a bribe. And uh, I want to dismiss a myth or a lie that we were treated equal. Jews have never been treated equal. At best, we were looked at a stranger at worst, we were looked as a traitor. Uh, I, so when I got the passport, I wanted to leave. I got a visa. But after the Iraqi failure, they refused me the visa to go to the United States to study. Seeing Shafiq Adas hanging, when my mother cried, and I cried with her too, and uh, I decided that is the end. I don't. I don't want to stay. Uh, my my dream of being. I'm uh, my home. Iraq Baghdad was my home. In Iraq was completely shattered. I didn't belong. So I, uh, I, my brother arranged. Uh, I took the train from Bas Baghdad to Basra, and from there, uh, we took the boat. As you saw the the sketch. And from there, we went to Iran. Uh, and uh, 
I, I describe that in my book so in details that really it's very, very dramatic to see what happened to us because it wasn't that easy. Uh, we couldn't make it. Uh, so in 1945, that's 1949, I traveled and I ended up in, in, uh, in, uh, in Iran. From Iran, I came to Israel. So the, yeah. Um, so when you left Iraq in 1949, uh, many families stayed behind. So what happened to the, to the Jews who stayed in Iraq? Well, uh, in 1951, uh, there was a decree that Jews could leave Iraq officially with one suitcase. And, uh, and they provided that they will lose their nationality. It's called in Arabic, al tasqit So out of the 130,000, 90% registered to leave. And they lost their properties and they took their suitcases one suitcase per person. And of course, everybody know that the Jewish wife has a lot of jewelry. So what they took with them, they were robbed at the airport by the officer and they only allowed them to take the ring on their hand. Uh, so uh, they left, they were not allowed to leave to Israel. So again, Alaska airline was involved they flew to Cyprus, and from Cyprus, they, live, they left to Israel. And my father and my brother stayed in order to try to liquidate the business. They had, uh, uh, they had an importing business, and they were, we were very prosperous. Uh, in fact, uh, in my teenage, we moved to a, a beautiful home very large home in, in an Alwiya district, close to the American embassy. Uh, we had uh, maid servants, a garden, a chauffeur with a car. And, uh, and I, you know, I, and, uh, and, and I, from there, but then my father, uh, what he succeeded, what's called to transfer money with the Hawala, which, uh, means that he, they give the money to a person in Baghdad and they give you a note that you could go to another country and show that note to uh, another person who will give you the money. It was a you know, very dangerous transaction because some people lost their money. It's based on trust. Luckily, my father and my brother got the money when they arrived to Israel. Thank you, Joe. So um, last question for you here. I'm in the middle of reading your book um, and I've learned recently that you've traveled to a hundred different countries in your lifetime. Uh, so tell us how you'd feel about going back to, to Baghdad if you would and, and what you think about that. Yes, my favorite hobby was traveling. I, I love to go and visit. It's my biggest education and, and my biggest knowledge that I see to make me appreciate life also. And, uh, uh, and I vi visited many Arab countries. I was in Lebanon uh, in 66. I was in uh, uh, Jordan in 2000. I was in Egypt twice in 1980 and 1984. I was in the Emirates, Dubai, and, uh, and Oman, and Abu Dhabi, and Bahrain in 2008. But really to think to go back to Baghdad, uh, it's beyond my imagination. I would not like to go and see where I was born. Uh, you know, uh, the fact that I was born there, I didn't choose my parents, I didn't choose my genes, I didn't choose my, my the environment I grew up with. And the, uh, the experience that I had, uh, when I got out of Iraq, I threw the key of my house emotionally from my mind. And I didn't want ever 
to think to go back. I looked up to the future. And as I said in my beginning remarks, that I am, I know, I learned the past, but I did not want to live in the past. In Israel, when I arrived, I uh, was angry. I was uh, uh, frustrated. I grew up uh, as a teenager uh, being spoiled uh, and uh, felt that center of the world and felt a sense of entitlement. But again, thanks to the Israeli Defense Force, the army, blew the burst by bubble of being the center of the universe and eliminated the sense of entitlement. Those are the ingredients of being unhappy. So uh, the Jews that left in Iraq after the, every, everybody left uh, suffered the same discrimination and suffered uh, uh, torture and they all left. And so my book is a summary of a uh, life journey experience. It's how I faced the uncontrollable and uh, events, uh, events that happened to my life. Uh, how do I, I, I know that I could not control events that happened to me, but I only control how I react to it. So how I managed uh, to, uh, to, to work with the events, how I learned to uh, see the beauty uh, and appreciate what I have in my hand and, uh, uh, and that I worked for three years. I never told any my family with my, the pain and suffering, the emotional pain till I joined uh, uh, writing memoir class in Santa Monica College. When I wrote first time about my escape, I cried all the way. And then I opened up, it was the sweet, uh, bittersweet tear. So my, my book is a, is, a, is, a, is a story that I think everybody identified because I faced hunger, I faced first death in the eye, I faced humiliation, I faced failure, as much as I faced success, happiness and failure, and love with the family and the friends. And, uh, and I, I wanted to talk very, uh, a, cu a couple of minutes of Haron Zangi, when in 69, the last picture that they accused after 67 war, accused Jews of spying, he was the only one that was let free. And he ended up finding his way to Los Angeles and I met him and his story is recorded at Jimena, the, uh, the oral history. Uh, so I, I thank you all. Uh, if you have any other question, I'll be delighted to answer. And thank you, Natalie, for moderating. And Sapir, who is behind the scene, did the all technical work. I thank you all for being present and I love you all. Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing your story with us. Um, we'd like to take a moment of silence to remember the lives that were lost during the Farhud and the destruction of Jewish life in Iraq. So let's observe a moment of silence before we continue our program. Okay. Joining us now is Lily Shore from the Babylonian Heritage Museum. Hi, Lily. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Hi, Natalie. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Can you please uh, start off by telling us a little bit about the museum? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, the Babylonian Jewry Heritage Museum. You can uh, also show the um, photos oh. if you can. Uh, the Babylonian Jewry Heritage Museum or Center uh, includes, of course, a research center, um, 
a library and also a museum. Uh, a very interesting and uh, overwhelming museum. Um, and it covers uh, more than 2,600 years. Uh, actually, uh, Joe's uh, lecture was very interesting and it touched uh, uh, a lot or uh, most of the things that uh, he spoke about uh, is uh, exhibited in, in the museum. Um, it uh, shows the life of uh, the history, first of all, the history of uh, since uh, the Babylonian um, exile, uh, when all the uh, uh, citizens of uh, the Judea uh, kingdom were taken to uh, Babylon. And uh, this is the, the Jewish uh, people, actually. So uh, this is displayed in the um, exhibition of uh, the history, the ancient history, and actually the uh, cylinder, the Cyrus cylinder, uh, was recent, recently added to our exhibition. Uh, it's very interesting and uh, moving. Uh, it is a, a replica, of course. Uh, we have also, uh, can you move on uh, with the slides? Uh, please, Natalie. Let me, oh, let me see what's happening here. One second. Uh, okay. So um, we have um, also, we touched the education, uh, the yeshivot, the uh, famous yeshivot, Sura, uh, Pombedita, Nehar Dea, the Talmud, the Talmud Bavli, um, the yeshivot under the caliphate, the Abbasid caliphate. Um, and uh, then um, uh, the invasion, the Mongolian invasion. Here we see uh, part of the museum. Uh, the museum, the museum is uh, designed as a house, an ancient, an old house of uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, which uh, uh, families, Jewish families, used to live in in the old neighborhoods that Joe uh, mentioned, and actually went where the Farhud uh, took place, where the Farhud riots um, took place. Uh, and we have the, um, uh, you, can, you can go on with the slides. So we have parts of the house. We have also, this is the, um, uh, in, um, the inner court, courtyard and the um, guest room for summer. Uh, we have, um, also the uh, replica of a small alley, the small alleys in the um, neighborhoods and the synagogue, the great synagogue. Uh, you can move on with the slides. Um, here is the alley, yes. Uh, this is the synagogue, part of the synagogue that you can see with the group of, uh, this is a family celebrating an event. Um, and we can, we can see also exhibition of uh, education, modern education. Uh, we spoke about the yeshivot, yes, and the religious um, aspect, of course, the Sifrei Torah, these Torah scrolls, and the Torah cases, the different kinds of Torah cases. This is from the Far East. We, can, uh, we have the exhibition of the um, uh, communities uh, and the Jews, the Baghdadi Jews who uh, uh, emigrated to the Far East, to Hong Kong, to, to India, to China, to Shanghai, to uh, uh, Singapore, to uh, Indonesia, to um, name it, just name it, uh, Burma, Rangoon. So uh, we have a very interesting exhibition speaking, talking, uh, showing this um, these uh, communities. Uh, we have uh, the uh, music uh, exhibition, the um, uh, life cycle, the Jewish life cycle. You can show this slide with the um, Sifrei Torah from all over Iraq. This is the uh, Shanashil, the guest room, in the verandas that we know from the old neighborhoods. Um, this is uh, the life cycle. It is the birth, the bar mitzvah, the wedding, and uh, the
the um, how they lived, how they lived, uh, what did they uh, wear? We're speaking about 100 years ago or more. Um, and we uh, also touch, well, this is the Aliyah, the immigration, the mass immigration. We can see that the stamps say, لا يسمح له العودة إلى العراق, that uh, the Jews uh, uh, call غحب uh, لرجعة. Every Iraqi knows this term of, uh, and, and the meaning of it. Uh, and actually, we have uh, the suitcases that uh, Joe mentioned. We have the uh, many suitcases, original suitcases. We have the um, tents, the rep um, uh, an exhibition of the absorption of the uh, camps uh, and the tents, the tin huts, the um, wooden huts that uh, the, live the, the Jews uh, from Iraq had to live uh, in because uh, no houses were uh, available for them when they came to Israel. You can uh, move with the slides. Yes, this is the tent. And uh, this is the hut, the, uh, the uh, kuch, trif. This is the tzarchania uh, uh, or uh, the shop that uh, they could uh, get uh, with coupons, uh, the the food they, they couldn't go to the supermarket like now and uh, take uh, everything into the cart. Uh, it was only by coupons and uh, according to a list. Uh, and so we have uh, many, um, uh, of course, the Farhud as well. Uh, we have an exhibition uh, of the Farhud, uh, a room especially for to commemorate the Farhud. We, we have the names of the victims on uh, written in English, in, in English and in Hebrew. You can show the slide uh, or the photo, if, uh, Natalie. Um, and we have annual and. Uh, Every year we have um, an event, a commemoration event, um, with speakers, uh, with lectures. Uh, we have also uh, research done, books published uh, in e Hebrew, in English, um, and also interviews, um, you know, evidence of the survivors, uh, we have you can you can go to our YouTube channel. You can go to our uh, Facebook page, uh, also to the uh, website of the Babylonian Jewry Heritage Center, and you can see uh, a lot of materials. Um, uh, of course, uh, not only about the Farhood, but uh, also uh, about the Farhood. Uh, a lot of uh, work is has been done. And we are uh, continuously uh, adding, like um, I think that two years ago or uh, last year, we added a name of um, another victim of the Farhud, because yes, this is uh, one of the, uh, this is a, only, a, I mean, a part of the uh, names. Uh, there's another column with, a name, with other names. Uh, um, and uh, if, uh, of course, we are um, inviting people if they um, uh, are aware of uh, uh, that are not mentioned or are not documented or uh, important uh, events that happen in the forehood or evidence uh, that can they can add, we invite them to uh, contact us in the uh, Babylonian Jewry Heritage Center and um, give us all the details. Um, we also, of course, have uh, archives, uh, photos, um, and uh, this is this is in the um, uh, in the center and. Uh, you know, uh, we, you are all invited to come and visit. You can visit the website. You can uh, have, you know, uh, 
uh, see uh, what are uh, what is available. We are uh, we also launched audio uh, tours. We have tours in uh, Hebrew, uh, English, Arabic, Judeo Arabic, uh, and we launched now uh, audio tours. You can uh, hi have earphones and go uh, by yourselves and uh, listen to. Uh, um, uh, audio in Arabic, English, or uh, Hebrew. Um, and uh, this uh, this year, uh, we'll have the uh, commercial event on the 9th of June, uh, and we will host uh, the lecturer, uh, Dr. Nisan Sharifi, whose uh, research uh, um, uh, speaks about uh, the uh, victims of the Farhud uh, that should be uh, 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 recognized as victims of uh, of the Nazis, uh, or the survivors of the the Farhud and the victims of the Farhud as uh, the victims of the Nazis. Um, and he will speak about that in the event on the 9th of June. And you are all welcome. We'll um, to. Uh, to, to be present. I invite you to come to the museum and uh, take part in, in this uh, event. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, so much for sharing that and uh, for the really important work that you guys are doing um, on behalf of all of us. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for joining. Thank you, Joe, so much for, for intimately sharing your story with us. Um, thank you, Sarah and Sapir and the rest of Jimena for having me. And uh, I hope uh, to see you guys in person soon and at future Jimena events. So thank you. Are the front of the book. Oh yes, this is this is Joe's book, everybody. Um, I really encourage you to get a copy. If you don't know how, reach out to any of us. We'll we'll help guide you. Thank you so much. It was a great uh, lecture, uh, Joe. Uh, very oh. interesting. You touched um, uh, a vast. Uh, actually, uh, most of the things that you spoke about is uh, displayed in the museum. Thank you, thank you all, Tadaraba, and thank you. Bye, Tadaraba. Bye. Bye.